Now from Archaeology News Northeast, the latest archaeology news and interviews from around the UK. This is Tales from the Trowel with Jackie and Sarah. Welcome back, everybody, to Tales from the Trowel. I'm Sarah. I'm Jackie. With Darren. Hello. Hello, Darren. How are you doing? Not too bad. How are you doing, Darren? Yeah. I'm really excited because <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about metal detecting. So, how did you get into it? <laughs> how did I get into um, it? It's always a funny question. It was. I've always been interested in histories and local history, mm. especially things like like Binchester and things like that. And um, but when when we were kids, when we were at school, um, where we lived, there was uh, there was two girls. You slip very close, went to school with. Mm. And they were the only ones in the town, or in, in, in our street, that had Sky Television. So we used to go and watch MTV, Party Zone on a Friday night. Uh-huh. So, but the, the, dad, the dad was like um, a bit of a, a John Rambo type character. You know, he went fishing, he went shooting, uh-huh. sold antiques. Um, he had a fantastic Audi Quattro, which was just amazing. <laughs> but also, he used to metal detect. And in his kitchen, he used to have these big oak display cabinets and all these like fantastic. I didn't know what they were, uh-huh. I still don't. And it just intrigued me and it always stuck with me and I thought I, I want to try this one day uh-huh. so fast forward a few years and we watch time team and things like that loads of times go up to the talks of Binchester and um, one morning I was getting ready for work and Mackenzie Crooks I thought I'd have the office it was on the TV it was promoting a new program that he had on that evening called The Detectorist mm. I thought that sounds all right so Sky Plus did and I never really gave it another thought. I watched it a couple of weeks later, watched them all, loved it. So I went and bought a metal detector. <laughs> and like anything else, because then you find that there's nowhere you can go. You need uh. permissions for anywhere to go. So when I was looking for land, initially I used to go along the Baths of Bishop. I think it's public land, who cares? And it was all molehills. I thought, uh. well, what damage can I do? It shouldn't have been there, really. So anyway, I bumped into someone walking the dog and he said that their grand- sorry, their son-in-law and his father were very keen metal detectors. So he put me in touch with those. And uh, I ended up joining the Dunhill Metal Detecting in 2015, I think. Oh, wow. So, so I guess Mackenzie Crooks is probably the answer, <laughs> which sounds a bit naff, but um, kind of, yeah. Kind of how it went. Yeah. It's such an idyllic programme to watch, though, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it does show metal detecting on sunny days yeah. uh, through beautiful scenery. Is that generally what it's like? No. <laughs> it's nothing like that. It's, it's, it is. It can be. But more often than not, in, in the UK, it's cold, it's drafty, it's windy, your feet are wet, your hands are wet, you're forever rubbing your nose. Uh-huh. And, and um, But no, no, it can be. In, in the summer, it's beautiful. You're out, the birds are singing, the buds are on the trees, and you're out with your friends. Mm-hmm wandering around, talking, chat, so... I presume you go around and you've got your headphones on, so is it more like a system of nods and waves if you want somebody to come and see if you found something? Uh, do you know, I think I think you developed some sort of sense because you're kind of scanning the field all the time to see where people are. You think, oh, they're digging up there. They've been digging a lot. I mean, just venture over that way. So you kind of see them when people get up and you get a group of people. So, But what we do now with the, obviously with technology is if anyone finds anything on the fields, we've got like a WhatsApp group. You take a picture, you post it on the group, then you can see people looking around trying to scan where you are. Then you get, you get like a gathering, and, and it's a lovely thing. It is really nice because you, you, it's nice when you find something, oh, yeah. and uh, you know everyone comes round because you, it's, it's yours. It's yeah. well, in theory, it's yeah, yours. Right. <laughs> you found it until disclaimed by whoever. So yeah, so that's that's kind of the joy of it. It's a social thing. Uh-huh. It's probably at first it was all about finding things, but I think through the course of time you get to know people in the club. You become friendly with people become friendly with the farmers people walking past because mm-hmm. if anyone walks past you they're always very interested in what you're doing and have you found anything so it becomes more of a social thing and, and in a way sometimes the detecting people sort of takes a back seat on a on a sunday you know we had a pie and peas sunday the other week <laughs> where we got uh, a load of pies from uh, taylor's pie shop in darlington and <laughs> christopher cut his burner so we had to warm the pies up with a, with a, with a, with a blow torch <laughs> So that was, that, that was, it was really windy as well. It was, it was absolutely blown again. This is the Sunday before Christmas. It was blown again, and we had some paper plates to make a job of it. So we put them on the table, and they were off for Christmas. So, 
<laughs> yeah, but it was good, and, and that's kind of what it is. Uh, it's, it's just it's a laugh on a Sunday. Oh, fantastic! So your club, um, do you have many members? Fifty-five. We have well, well it's roughly fifty-five. We, we cap it at 55 just for, for logistics, really. Uh, out of the 55, there's probably 25 really, really active members that you, you guaranteed you'll see every week. Um, but no, everyone plays a part. But there's, there is, 50, I think we have a cap of 55. We have a waiting list. I think there's about six or seven still on the waiting list, which is pretty good. We don't really push it. We don't advertise it. I think you can find it if you search online, it comes up. But um, yeah, it, the reason for the cap is if you've got 60, 40 cars to get into a field on a Sunday... And it's muddy, it's boggy, yeah. it's just a nightmare. Uh-huh. So yeah. you kind of have to have reasonable numbers. I know there is some metal det- uh, some Facebook groups that you can just kind of turn up your pay your money, which which is great. And sometimes they have really big numbers. Mm-hmm. And I often think, oh, that's got to be a nightmare. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but no, it works mm-hmm. and, it's, and it's good. So, so if anybody wanted to put their name down on the waiting list, um, you give us your contact details and we can let people know. Yeah, we'll do, yeah. Yeah. Um, as I say, there is there is there is a waiting list. Um, when you get members in, they don't tend to, to drop out. Yeah, yeah. So you know, so some people can be on the list. There's two lads. The two lads. Um, they waited nearly two years. We thought they'll have got somewhere else yeah. by now. But no, no, they were still waiting. So. Yeah. So it's worth persevering. If you want to do that, yeah. See, our it's, it's a traditional club. As in, we have meetings every two weeks. We have a raffle. You have a subscription. Um, you know, it's like a traditional club where now it kind of, sort of tenders towards these. Facebook groups yeah. where you, you join the group and then they, they post this is the events this weekend you take go on maybe go on not go on mm. and you pay up you just turn up and pay your money see if that's how they do it and that's fantastic yeah. if if you just want to do it like casually and just recreationally yeah. you know uh, the way we do it, it it becomes we're more of a community what would you say is the uh... Like the processes to go through to actually be able to get out and and start detecting somewhere. Uh, I mean, so is it starting like maybe with like equipment that you yeah. might need? I mean, I'm just just from my point of view. I mean, obviously other people will give you different advice, but just I would say go out with someone who does it. Hmm. Try and find someone who does it. It's you can buy cheap machines. There is cheap machines out there, and then they've got the place. There's nothing wrong with. It. It's just I think you're making it hard at the start with. So you go out and and without knowing what you're doing, you'd be digging cork, you'd be digging iron, you'd be digging. A lot and it, it'll dishearten you mm-hmm. i think it will um so maybe go out with somebody who has had a little bit of experience and they can say look on the machine it does discriminate so some of your low numbers are furacy the higher numbers are, are more sort of magnetic numbers you kind of want to know where you need to be so if you if you pick like a tight area so you're just getting copper and silver yeah. you mightn't dig as much but you will yeah i would say go out with someone give it a couple of goes and, and if you like it probably i think it's probably wise to invest in a, mach- a good second hand machine rather than a cheap machine and yeah and just if you set your parameters on the machine quite narrow so you only dig on certain targets and then after a while you'll you'll learn what to dig and what not to dig so um and join a club if that's what you want to do or there is they'll say there's these really good facebook groups and you can get out if you want to go out once a month once every six months you all seem pretty good so i did what you said uh find a friend um and go out with them um and i've had a a couple of digs but we went to the beach yeah um and i found that a really good training ground yeah. because you weren't spoiling anything you you don't need if i'm right you don't need permissions for beach detecting it's beach beaches beaches are crown estates so you you, you can once we get to print off a, a permission form off the internet i think they've scrapped that now so i think you're fine on most beaches between the high tide and the low tide you can't go beyond that so yeah yeah beaches you, you can go to the thing i have not much experience with beaches but we went to to see them is the same where they go for the glass oh the yes uh-huh. we went to see them and I don't know whether it was with the glass production around there, but there's little tiny sort of slithers or little, little sort of balls of aluminium mm-hmm. and it's everywhere and that's all we were digging all day uh-huh. so in the end we were helping this American lady dig fine bits of glass so, right. so my experience <laughs> on beaches isn't great like. no mine wasn't to be honest um, <laughs> I think you spent about four hours yeah. and I found uh, a very very rusty one pence piece Yeah, I found a bomb, a bomb. oh you found a bomb Oh, yes, found a bomb did. See him. <laughs> Me and a friend of mine, Pat, Scottish lad, and he rocked up. I mean, it's all pebbles, same beach. And he came because he's Scottish, short and flip flops, of course. How else are you going to go to Pebble Beach when you're Scottish? So anyway, we're just literally just taking a walk. It was a, it was a summer's night, and we saw some shiny, you know, the archaeologist magpie. Then I'm like, the hell is that? So we start sticking with our hands and we're putting, putting barnacles off it and it was getting bigger and bigger. And I'm like, what on earth is it? So we yanks it out the sand and it's like clagged with stuff. So I sets about it with a rock. So we're 
crashing oh like God. rocks <laughs> off to, to bash the barnacles off and we've got it like placed on this wrong boat scratching our heads thinking kind of looks like something but I kind of figure it out and then like we'll give it a really good wallop on the end where there was this big thing and like the little I can only describe it as like a detonator thing <laughs> like fell off and there was like a, a, a button cog thing on the inside and we're both like step back and you know when you're like oh dear me how <laughs> well we didn't have a phone signal so I ended up having to like wade into the north sea to get a signal and I rang 111 I was like look it might be nothing but this thing's looking a little bit shifty and we've got it on the beach and she's like can you send us a picture so give us the email address she's like stay on the phone so I pictures it walks back into the sea so I can talk to her and she's like just hang fire with us she's like we've got a couple of guys like having a look at the picture so I'm just standing and I've got me back to that <laughs> And I'm on the phone and it's getting dark and she says, right, she says, don't move. She's like, we're on the phone to Cat Rick now. <laughs> she's like, we're sending the police. She's like, if you just step away from it. And I turns around and he's got his eye. We're like that. And he's looking in the thing and I'm like, oh my God, I need to ring his parents and say, well, I've got his flip-flops, but his face is in Norway. You know what I mean? I'm like, no, put it down. Like, you really need to put it down. And he's like, what's the matter? I was like, send it to me. And I'm like, I'm at this like, And then there's people coming and we're like, hey, like, you need to like go away because like there's people coming and like we don't know what this is so like panic sets in and then we could see the torches and the police like clearing the beaches that came towards us and I'm just stood there mortified and then like they cordoned it off and like took our names and everything and like we left and then I get home my husband said you're meant to be going for a brew in Bishop Auckland one how the hell did you get to see him like <laughs> two what do you mean you found a bomb and I was like well, it was a bomb so, and that's the only thing I've ever found. <laughs> did it, did it, it's a memorable thing. It was, it. Yeah, it was. It did was, it detonate I'm assuming so. I didn't actually hear anything, like, after that point. I don't know if they just picked it up and took it, or it might have been, like, a hairdryer accessory or something. <laughs> but it lo- they obviously thought it was dodgy for them to send somebody out. We had something last year, it, it, it's slightly similar. We were we were a million miles from Catrick, and we were out, and in the group there's a lot of ex-military. Because uh-huh. it's kind of a natural progression from my guess. And um, we have this Polish lad. Uh-huh. And, and marching is fant- oh, well, march fantastic. And in Poland, when you go on metal detecting in Poland, it, there is different rules and regulations yeah. out there. So they kind of just rake around in the trees. But when when the the, 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 the Germans retreated from Russia, uh-huh. they sort of abandoned a lot of the military equipment. So there's lots of oh, them so to find. So there. that's what they're looking for. So anyway, we were in this field and um, one of the guys was shouting. So someone went over and, and they're all standing looking around at this hole. And you think, oh, what have they got? So you're watching and then somebody else comes over. And then they were shouting for another guy. This other guy is a major in the army. And he come over and he looked. And then it's started shouting for my I'm like, oh, we'll see what's going on here. <laughs> I said, what do you think? He said, oh, we've got a bomb. <gasps> And I said, honestly, he said, yeah, yeah, a bomb, I've never seen one. And they got Martian over and Martian, and he said, oh, Martian, what do you think? He's bomb, he's bomb. <laughs> and he scurried away. So we kind of panicked. So we, we went to see the farmer, to tell the farmer, because this is, he wasn't keen about letting us on anyway. So, <laughs> so he said, right, okay. And, and they have a number, all the farmers know the number for, for the military police in Catrick. And he said, right, can you clear the landlords? And the, it started to rain. He said, oh, the, the police will be coming. Anywhere, and we never ever found out. But according to them, and they know. Uh-huh. I mean, Peter was in in artillery, so he don't know what a bomb looks yeah, like. Yeah, But yeah, apparently that's where else. But we don't know what happened. No, we we never found yeah, out. We never an, found out anything at all. You find hand grenades. Ah. Down in Bransworth, over in Bishop, there was a war camp. And oh right. You find lots of hand grenades, Damn. and it's like a, on the bottom, it's like the charge. It screws into uh-huh. the bottom hand grenades. You find loads of them. So I mean, they're not live. Uh-huh. They're not live. Yeah. But, um, but we wouldn't recommend picking any. I, of. <laughs> <laughs> if you do come. <laughs> Cross one. But that's it if you don't know, you don't yeah. want to. Yeah, so uh-huh. you get some cool, cool, yeah, yeah. There's definitely some cool <laughs> things hidden you about. <laughs> so when it comes, because obviously you can't just go, just go digging around. No, you can't. You so what's what? What do you do if you spot somewhere and think? I want to have a little shufties. What what do you have to do to, to get there? Right. Well, all the land, all the land in the UK is owned by somebody. Mm-hmm. So you need permission. If you go on the land without permission, you, it's, it's trespassing and, it, and it's basically theft if you remove yeah. anything from the land. So, yeah, so you want permission. Mm-hmm. So even on public land, you might think, oh, you're fine on public land. On public land, the only the only thing you have is access to it mm-hmm. or a passage through it. You've got, you, you can't do anything like that. So... It, 
you find out where you want to be, you think this could be good, you like the lie of the field, you like the rigging through, look of it or anything like that, just go and ask the farmer or ask the landowner. A... <laughs> which isn't always easy because the piece of land next to this farm might be farmed by a farmer who's six miles away. Uh-huh. So sometimes it can be a bit of a, a Sherlock Holmes moment to try and deduce who owns the land. Uh-huh. You try and work out which tractors have the tractors <laughs> got into the field there. He hasn't come back this far. Uh-huh. So yeah, just go and ask the farmer or the landowner. That's a really pretty good. Mm-hmm. I was always really nervous about asking initially. Mm-hmm. Don't want to do this and don't uh, want to do this. But they're fine. If you uh, ask them, they, they're quite fine. Quite happy to talk about the land. They're quite happy to talk about the property. Yeah. Just ask. Some farmers are very... Because at the end of the day, you're a guest on their land. Yeah. So they are responsible for your safety. Yeah. So their insurance is slightly covering you in yeah. a way. Just ask. You can uh, only say no. Yeah. And, uh, and if they ask, just... Make an agreement. Yeah. Just say, look, it, it'll be for once, for twice. Yeah. Uh, and I'll park here or I won't park uh-huh. there and I won't dig here. And uh-huh. so, yeah, just, just try and get a bit of trust with the farmer. Yeah. And it's fine. So is there some sort of rules or regulations when you're on that land about how to how to behave kind of? Well, there's the um, there's a country court initially. Right. So if, if a gate's open, you leave it open. It's closed, you leave it closed. Uh, you don't disturb the wildlife. Don't, um, if you see any waste or your own waste, dispose of it. So, yeah. Just kind of look after it just look yes. after, yes. after it and honestly uh, you, you want to leave it as you found it mm-hmm. so if you're digging holes then you, you're going to put the soil back in yes. and, and, and leave the yeah. the ground as it was so, some farmers are good enough to let your own crop land where, where the crop's coming through a little bit mm-hmm. so you have to be really really careful to make sure that everything it looks like it yeah. was uh, but even on stubble you might think oh, it's only stubble who cares but put your hole back and tramp it down and, yeah. and make it look as neat as you can yeah. so you're in your field you're digging away and you you get a nice signal for silver, for instance. Um, right, so you get a good signal. Yeah. You you go over it. You go back and forth. Turn it around. Go the other way. So you sort of you know roughly where it is. You dig out your plug. Just go around a nice circle. Mm. Turn out your plug and scan your plug hopefully if the item's in your plug but if it's not you have what, what was a probe it's like it's like a long carroty looking, Carrot. <laughs> looking thing yeah and uh, it just detects metal so you know it's just it's just easier than keep picking bits of mud up and while well, sort of wind, waving them over your clo- over your, your coil so you detect it you get it out the ground retrieve your target uh-huh. and then make sure you put everything back but always scan always make sure if you've took something out the ground always check because there could be two yeah. always mm-hmm. check that there wasn't something else in there and sink but yeah when it comes to, cl- if you find a copper coin, sometimes it's best to let them dry before you attempt to clean them. Because if you do try and clean them when they're wet, sometimes it can it removes the patina or sometimes it'll remove the copper. So sometimes it's wise to let them dry. Silver coins, you can clean. Gold, mm. if you're lucky enough, should be pristine and you can clean that. Have little little squirty bottles of water, little spitzers, what are they called? Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah and yeah. then just, uh-huh. just to try and clean things up. Yeah. And, and now if it's a nice item, as I said before, we use the WhatsApp, it's like, oh, I want to show everybody this. And uh, and you, if it is a nice item, you get a nice crowd round and everyone's an expert. Uh-huh. Everyone's an expert. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that I thought, like, it's not, I'm not also OCD or anything. If you ever want to collect different samples of spit, uh-huh. this is a good way of doing it. Because everyone, when you get it, <laughs> you say, oh, you say, oh, what is it? You spit on it, and look at it. Then you pass it to the next person. It was cleaning it up a bit more. Until everyone spat on your coin. <laughs> and then you give it your back and you think, well. Oh. Yes, thank you. Bother now. So if we found a coin, uh, if we were digging uh, an archaeological site, we would then, if we found a coin, we would then give it a context number uh, and plot where it is in the world using the GPS. Mm. If you find something in the field, how do you record where it's found? What's your processes? I, I, I mean, not everybody does it, but it's a similar process. On, on Google Maps, you can put your marker down. It will give you uh, your, your coordinates. So you, you can keep that, but you kind of know. You know where you found it. So when it comes to record, if you record it with the, the Farns Liaison, or the Portland Antiquities game, they'll want uh, the coordinates. Right. Mm. So kind of what they do, the Farns Liaison, it'll show you a map and you just pinpoint on the map to the roughly 10 square metres and they record it from there but you can record it yourself if you want to and generally if you take a picture of it you can look at the picture later yeah. and, and the GPS coordinates are in there anyway right uh-huh. yeah but as a general is that the, the, the metadata of, yeah, the, yeah. of the picture yeah, yeah. right yeah so if you find a copper coin it doesn't really matter where you found it mm-hmm. it's it, you know, you, you get to keep it. So, you know, so what kind of things would you um, inform the portable antiquities scheme 
people have, have the finds? When when would you say this is you know a, an item that we should pass on and tell them yeah, about? Yeah, because I'd get excited. I'd be like treasure. I would, I'd yeah. be like Gollum. I'd, I'd be scurrying <laughs> home with me with me finds. Do you know what I mean? You're not realizing. I, I, I have a beach all of them. finds bag <laughs> full of pure rubbish, pure pure garbage. But it's treasure to me. It's treasure. You know. Uh-huh. So yeah. when do you decide what's what's treasure? It's. I mean, there is there is some pretty strict rules in place. And, and if you don't know them, somebody around you or somebody in the club will say, look, that needs to be handed in. Um, because we have we have a deals with the farmers that if any items of any value are found, that it will be sold and, and, and the fee will be split. So we have a duty to the farm. So even if it's something that isn't treasure, mm-hmm. it still might be worth a few hundred pounds. So it's only fair that we do it that way. But treasure, treasures, if, if it's treasure, you've got 14 days by law to, to report it. Not handed in, just to report it. So... It's a kind of a bit of a grey because they've just they've just rehashed the the, 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 the Treasure Act mm-hmm. to include it, it's a little bit more ambiguous now. So what is treasure? So so any metallic object, but not coins, that's at least ten percent by weight precious metal. So like rings yeah. or you know stuff like that. Uh, a group of two or more metallic objects of any composition, but with a prehistoric sort of date, so really old stuff. Two more coins from the same hole that are more three hundred years that contain precious metal. Mm-hmm. That's become a bit of a, a bone of contention that one because really, <laughs> yeah. two coins in yeah. a hall is now it can be classed as a hoard but uh, it's not what you would automatically nah, assume to be a hoard when you think about hoards it's uh-huh. usually you know you know a, a pot full yeah. of full of gold coins uh-huh. or something yeah. not just a couple of pennies two or side by side but now it's kind of it can be a hoard by association mm-hmm. So you could go to a village, a small village, and say you find a Roman gold coin of Nero at one end of the village, find another one at the other end of the village, and one in the middle of the village, even though they could be in a two-mile square area, they can still be classed as a hoard of coins because there is an association. There's something happened for them yep. coins to be in that area. Uh-huh. So it, it's, they have changed it slightly. And I understand why. They, so yeah. just hand them in, let them, <clears throat> let them fight it out. And yeah. Sort of <laughs> um, and any, any object whatever it's made of, that's being found with an item of treasure. So it could be like a pot. Yeah. If, it, if it's a load of coins, it could be the pot. The pot also needs to be recorded. But yeah, but the, the, with the recent update, they changed it where treasure can be an item of significance. Mm-hmm. So who, 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 who decides, who if, decides it's if it's significant? significant? Yeah. I think it's been brought in because cause you'll know about the Crosby Garrett helmets. Yes. So because yes. it was it was made of bronze, was it bronze or brass? It didn't fall under the Treasure Act, mm-hmm. so it was then returned to the finder, who sold it for quite a considerable amount of money, and I think subsequently it's been sold for quite a considerable amount more money. Oh, okay. And it, mm-hmm. it's not in the hands of any museums. We're not in the UK, I believe. So I think they tweaked it just so they at least they get to have a say. Yeah. Yeah. So things, things don't slip through the nets. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, but there is. <laughs> If you don't have things, that's when, when there is laws. And if you don't record something within them 14 days, you can receive up to three months in prison. And uh, I think it's uh, it's quite a hefty fine. Wow. I think it's unlimited, an unlimited fine. Yeah. So, but I think as detectorists, I think 99.9% are quite excited to hand it in. Yeah. Because it's the process. You want to be part of the process. Yeah. And you want you want the kind of fanfare of, of the item you found. Yeah. yeah. And if it, if it makes it into a magazine or... Yeah, like that. Yeah, then you're. It's because of you. It's yeah, because yeah. you you found that. Now yeah, everybody yeah. else knows about it, and it's kind of that. That's yeah. that's the pull. There's very little financial reward in that. <laughs> as as Jackie, you know, Jackie helped me with a, a newspaper article, a magazine article. I was just going to say, I think that nicely segues into yeah, that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I wrote it. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I think we started writing, and Jackie, bless her, she did a lot of work for us. So anyway, we, it, he ended it, and um, I phoned the editor, and he was like, Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I didn't have to do much for that. Oh, that's Jackie, not me. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so it was a three page spread uh-huh. in, in a metal detector magazine. And you think, oh, do you know, I'm a, I'm a publisher, I'm a £75. Pound. Nice. So it's £25 pound yeah. a page. Uh-huh. Which. It's fantastic. <laughs> so good. What, what, what was this? I've got 40 stories of it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm just going to try and get interested in your breakfast. I mean, no, I'm not going to sell this story. So, anyway. 
<laughs> so this piece that you did for the magazine, what was what was the item that you found? I don't tell. I don't know. Sound. I don't think I'm thinking of it. No, I did. Uh, the, the last one we did was um, it was a lead ring, and it was a, a decade ring, mm-hmm. and, and it's it just like a crude, thick lead ring. And it had nine or ten bobbles on it, and then on the I think it was nine, and on the top it has a little picture of Christ. Uh-huh. And it was a decade. It, it was it was a replacement for rosary beads uh, during the sort of Henry the Eighth time of the when he wasn't very keen on the Catholic <laughs> Church and stuff like that. He outlawed rosary beads, so mm-hmm. they made these rings. So I found this ring, and when they opened the Faith Museum, we, we got invited to like it's like a podcast, not a podcast. What was it? It's like a teams meeting, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. This was like COVID, so like yeah. we'll give it a go. You sit there, and everyone's face is uh-huh. like. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> so anyway, we did that, and they were just saying that we've got certain things earmarked to go on display and I thought I wonder if I've got anything and I thought I wonder, I wonder if they'd be interested so I, I brought it to the attention mm-hmm. and and yeah they said oh yeah it's fantastic we've seen one on the port and did this game I said oh I think it's that one to be honest and um, yeah so they, they took that one and as, as an added bonus out of it what happened was when they opened the museum they, they were having a they accepted it and it's been displayed in the museum oh. I'm very pleased with it so I got an invite to it said, it said VIP mail and VIP oh. tour of the new museum and I just assumed that all the volunteers at Open Castle were getting this so I phoned a few people and I said oh you go I don't know about that that's weird. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was, I was down as a, um, a donor or a, a lender or a, a contributor or something uh-huh. like that. And uh, yeah, so we, we were in, we had, we had a meal with uh, the Bishop of Salisbury. And, um, <laughs> there was um, a chaplain from Afghanistan, army guy. There was doctors and vicars and, you know, it was, uh-huh. it was quite weird. Quite surreal. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, pinch yourself more. Hi, hi. This, you know, like, this, this little thing, that this big chunk of lead uh, that I've found. Uh-huh. So, you know, I, I was thank goodness that you did hand it in because look at what happened. It, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's now become a display in the museum uh-huh. and you get a fancy meal out of it. Well, <laughs> it, it is kind of, it's like, it's through metal Detecting, uh-huh. through metal detecting like after I started we got to detect the spoil heaps at Binchester mm. for the archaeologists and I never thought we'd ever do this and I've jumped at the chance it wasn't me exactly but I went along with somebody else uh-huh. and we got talking to some of the volunteers Jackie and, and Stephen and uh, uh, various others and they said would you put your name down you can come and do it uh-huh. can, we, can we do this can you just go like, I'm, I'm, not that, I'm not really that bright I mean I don't think I can. <laughs> but no we did it and, and that's how I got into volunteering with the Auckland project mm. And uh, we've had a couple of years at Binchester doing archaeology and a couple at the, the castle. Uh-huh. And it kind of, kind of stems from there. And you meet people, are you Jackie? And you end up doing uh, a podcast <laughs> about something you vaguely know about. <laughs> Just spirals out yeah. of control. It, 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 oh, it, it gets right. worse, Dan. It gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, ah. so I went to this meal and, uh, and I said, so what do you do? Mm. And they're like, oh, right, right, right. I've got a clue what he said. And, uh, and it was really good. And, you know, like, and Jonathan was there. Jonathan was on the next table with his is this wife. This Jonathan Ruffy. Jonathan Ruffy, yeah. And, you know, he couldn't be nicer. Yeah. I don't think he, I don't think he probably thought I was some sort of some sort of dignitary. Some sort of dignitary. <laughs> well, you were. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I'd also be socks on. But anyway. Oh, so a good time was had by all anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. sauteed potatoes like, yes just potatoes <laughs> who knew who knew <laughs> just get a smaller portion <laughs> I can't be granny's been doing them for you <laughs> my well, class didn't even know oh. didn't even know it <laughs> do, you, do you want to talk us through some of these amazing things that you've got on the table here <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, th- I think as a detectorist, one thing I learned pretty quickly on you sort of, you're sort of, I don't know, your your achievements as a metal detectorist or your your sort of standard in the metal detecting world is, is on how many hammered coins you found in, in in a certain period. So hammered coins tend to be what we all shout. If you find uh, goals, obviously, but that, yeah. that doesn't happen very often. Do you do the dance? For gold? Yes. yes. So you do the gold dance? I have found a gold coin once. Right, and did you dance? Well, your back wasn't good that day. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, I did do it. And uh, that day it's a uh, Victorian half sovereign from 1895, I think, or something. And it's lovely. It's uh, But no, I, I did do a sort of dance, but... Some of them do the dance, you know, and it's... it's Wait, <laughs> I, I'm totally... Like, what dance? Oh, have I missed a the dance? Gold, the gold dance. If you find gold, it's 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 traditionally in the detecting world. It's celebrated by doing a dance. 
So I mean, you're not to be really descriptive of this dance scene. We haven't got any cameras, so, so, so it's not it's not come dancing. It's basically just it? waving your arms around it? and going woohoo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that like a John Travolta thing, like in a field or something, oh, no, like no, imagery? No, 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 it's, just, no, no it's, but it's, big, it's such a big deal, and you just yeah. want everyone to know uh-huh. that what you found isn't, you know, it's it's nothing. Oh, it is just it's gold, uh-huh. and doing the dance signals to. All the other detectors sit that in the area. Like, the, their gold. antennas go up, <laughs> and then yeah. oh, someone's doing the dance. <laughs> it's not choreographed. You know, I know. It's very impromptu. So it's very like some sort of like moonwalk or something like that. <laughs> <field. laughs> you know, People come yeah. flocking, you know, the hips. The robot. Of a robot. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> but now I know if I yeah. see, yeah. So you see yeah. somebody yeah. doing the robot yeah. in a field. Yeah. There's gold. <laughs> I thought it was just like I'd stick to the caterpillar. <laughs> but, but not when I found it, I did find it, and, and I was quite new to the club, so I was a bit embarrassed. And I, I, I didn't shout, I did sit with it a little bit, thinking, I'm going to do this. <laughs> so I did it, and, and then you just do some stuff. <laughs> There's a cork, a lot, it's beautiful. But I think, as, as a, I think it's more celebrating it when you find a hammered coin. Right. Because uh-huh. you, you get in the thing, and someone shouts, hammered! <laughs> so what's the difference between the regular coins and a, and a hammered coin? Right. Coins, it's it's a production. It was how they produced. Hammered coins, I think, from, from Greek times. The way they did, they got a blank flan, like a blank disc, and they had two dies, one on the top, one on the bottom, and they used to strike it with a hammer, mm-hmm. and that would give you the imprint on either side. Ah. So you, what you'd do is you'd have a plan, like a blank disc, mm-hmm. and you'd have a, a die, a top die and a bottom die, and you'd put them on, and you hit it with a hammer, and that would impress on the coin, on the silver coin or yeah. whatever, the image. So that's kind of pretty much how it was made. And, and, and that made, if, if it's slightly missed stroke, or it's not off shape. So you find a lot of hammered coins, medieval coins especially, where they're not regular. Uh-huh. They might be worn over to the sides, and they're not really good, but it's the silver content. That's the important thing. But once you got into sort of industrial revolution time, during Henry VIII's time, they, they debased the money quite heavily. Uh-huh. So it wasn't sterling silver anymore. It was maybe only 10, 20% silver, and the mm-hmm. coins were rubbish. They were really, really bad quality. So I think it was the French initially that started doing it, that they were making the coins by, like, cutting them out, like, using heavy machinery, and yeah. they were getting pressed out of the metal. Uh-huh. And then to make, like, nice discs, and they had a milled edge. Uh-huh. So that it was nice. So I think it was in Elizabeth... I'm not brilliant on history, but I think it was in Elizabeth the first time she commissioned... I think it was the London Mint. That's how she wanted them doing. Mm-hmm. So they, they came up with the machinery to do it. And ironically, the the, the, the guy, the, the mint guy from the London Mint, because this was such an efficient way to make coins, mm-hmm. the mints of the country started to demise because there wasn't the work, because one mint could do the work. Yeah. So he, he became unemployed. And, and subsequently, he was arrested about 10 years later for uh, counterfeiting coins. <laughs> so, but yeah, so, the coins, so there were much more regular coins. Like you see nowadays, ah. you've got like a raised edge. So that was some... Some Elizabeth, so 1600s onwards. But previous to that, the, the, the only method was to hammer the coins. So, so hammered coins. But the hammered coins people tend to shout for is sort of 1066 onwards, yeah. the, 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 the medieval period, right away through. Yeah. So, so the, on um, these ones, the, um, the pattern goes right up to the edge. There is no sort of fringe no. or anything around them. And so how, how, how does that happen? So there's, you know, you were saying they were stamped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there would there would have been a, a bit of spare silver around the edge. Yes, that well, doesn't seem to be there anymore. Well, it could be a process they used to do is with the coins they used to shave just shave little tiny bits of silver off the coins and they'd collect it up mm-hmm. and then you can melt that down and sell the silver. So they used to clip the coins. You get coins that's really really quite badly clipped. In theory, they used to wear. They used to have scales. Some 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 shops would would wear the money and say, "Well, okay, well, that's not." That's yeah. not mm-hmm. five grams of silver, or whatever it would be. So yeah, the coins would get clipped. So they did. They did try to, to, to sort of detract that. They, they they made the cross to the edge of the coin, and if that cross had been clipped, you I, could I suppose tell. ideally you weren't yeah. supposed to accept that as money. Yeah. But, so what about when there was coin shortages? Then you do find on the pennies, you do find half coins, like half a hammered coin. Yeah. And and that just basically give people the change. If they're buying a chicken and the chicken's, you know, it's two for a penny, they, they know you want one, you have to cut so they cut the coin in half. So that was a half penny. Right. And then they would cut it into quarters. Uh-huh. 
and then you could find little quarter hammer coins. Uh, do not, they turn not, up? I was going to say, do yeah, they turn they do, up? They, I suppose they're quite difficult to detect because they will give you a very low number on the detector because they're very thin, but they don't turn up. So they would cut them into quarters, a fourth of them, which is where you get your farthings. Oh, oh, farthing oh is a, yes. a fourth ah, of a, No, I didn't so. know that. Oh, oh I, I like learning yeah. something now. Oh, right. yeah. So, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I believe. <laughs> so, so, yeah, no, you find, you find quite a lot. Mm. You find quite a lot like that. These, well, you've got a huge collection here. Um, yeah, on the coins, you, 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 it's quite surprising how many Roman coins you do find. Mm. In the northeast of England, you do find quite a few. Not, not, not as many as you do hammer. I've heard it said anyway. It's ridiculous. But I've heard it said that every field has a hammered coin. I mean, it, it hasn't. Uh -huh. But it does give you an idea of how common they are. Yeah. And, you know, you go out and, and most weeks you do, someone will find uh -huh. a hammered coin. Yeah. And it always amazes me. You probably find modern pennies, Elizabeth, all the way back to like the, the, the 20th century. Also, mm. you do find a lot of modern stuff. But hammered coins are pretty rare, uh, pretty common, and so are Roman. Saxon coins on their hand, you would very rarely get Saxon yeah. coins. I've found one, found one Saxon coin, a little uh -huh. Saxon bronze skate. But they're very rare. Uh -huh. And and pre prior to that, like your Celtic coins, people find them, but... Yeah. I've never been close. But it's the other things you can find, really. It's just the quirky things. Brooches, badges, buttons. Mm -hmm. Now you think, oh, buttons, who wants buttons? <laughs> but the little four-hole buttons. Yeah. Like, what the... Have you had a shoddy? No. They, they, they would throw the old military uniforms that they used to have in the First World War mm -hmm. and stuff. That They would throw them on the fields. They would rot down. Yeah. And and you get all the buttons, the little four-hole tiny buttons. You get so many of them. Uh -huh. but, but there's collectors of buttons. Yeah. There's always a collector for everything. There is one chap... That we've been in touch with, he collects uh, militia buttons mm -hmm. for local militias, and he'll pay you quite a lot of money for like eighteen twenty pound for oh. a, a little button. And he's after uh, the Weirdale militia. This, oh. this is his, this is his uh -huh. sort of holy grail, the Weirdale militia. So if anyone has a Weirdale yeah. militia, <laughs> he, um, he pays quite well. Bullets, lots of bullets, yeah. lots of bullets. Yes. I mean, the beer, yeah. Then he that metal detectors yeah. like musket balls, quite uh -huh. a lot of musket balls. Well, what's really common? Apart from lead, a lot of lead. <laughs> Would you say, going back to detectorists, you find a lot of ring pulls? You, you know you do. <laughs> you, you do, yeah. And I have to ask, did you find Tizer? Do you know what? It, 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 <laughs> when, when, Lance, when Lance finds things, he gets the thing, he goes, oh, it's a, uh, uh, it, it's what, it, a Lilt 1930 thing? <laughs> it doesn't say it. It doesn't, does it? doesn't say anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it, I wondered, how did he know it was Lilt? Yeah. I mean, he gets his little... Yeah. Jeweler, doesn't yeah. he? And he has a closer <laughs> look and he's like, oh, Lilt uh, 19, whatever. Cash <laughs> full super. <laughs> <laughs> They don't have anything on them. Oh. So I thought that. I thought I'll take more notice in future. But they don't. I thought it might, it might actually cheer up or find something. But you find lots of, lots of tin cans. Yeah. Uh -huh. People drive around your cars, you just throw them out the window. Farmers drive around yeah. the tractors, they might. A couple of cans of lager, eh, not lager, they wouldn't drink that. <laughs> eh, coke, they've got lots of coke, wouldn't they? Coca Cola. Um, so you do find a lot of that. Biscuit wrappers, because yes. they foil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Crisp wrappers. Crisp uh -huh. wrappers. Yes, that's what yeah. I found on the beach, actually. I yeah. spent a long time trying to, when I was just getting to know my machine, and I was like going backwards and forwards and listening to the beep, and I spent a lot of time, I, I very carefully dug, like mm -hmm. I was excavating, because I was so new uh -huh. to metal detecting, that I was treating it like, <laughs> like an archaeology <laughs> site. And, and, and my friend that was with me just said, just dig it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. Should, it'll be about that deep, just, just dig it out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I spent a lot of time... I, Excavate in a crisp packet. <laughs> <laughs> How old was it, Jake? How I'm old not was too it? sure. It was uh, Seabrook salt and vinegar. <laughs> I, I, I do try and find the self idea on them, just just for interest. Just interest think it right? yeah. in 1930s. But, um, I mean, that can be a thing. If you're in the middle of a field, ploughshares off the ploughs, yeah. you find a lot of them, because if, especially if it's stony mm. land, it, it breaks the ploughshares. So you find a lot of them. So if you get them, the thing to do, you take them to the hedge, and you chuck them in the hedge because, yeah. you know, you don't want to cause... If you've had horses in the field, you know, the spikes that they mm. knock into the yes, ground for yeah. the horses, you can punch your tyres, so get rid of them. And a lot of rubbish goes into the hedge, but really it should be took away and disposed of properly. Sometimes you're weighed down if you've got a lot of lead in your pockets. You know, the thing, and <laughs> yeah. And it's, yeah. it's from your trousers. This, <laughs> this was one of the things that we found on the beach, that as we were working our way along, we found stacks and stacks of rubber gloves, mm. But industrial ones, so you can think maybe these have come off the deep sea fishermen who are, yeah, you know, like out at sea and, and they, they're losing the gloves and they're washing mm. up on Red Car Beach. Yeah. And we went along and it was just glove, another one, another one, another one. 
But as we looked along the beach, there was so much plastic yeah. on the beach that yeah. it was a we couldn't possibly tackle all of this yeah. i mean luckily there is groups that come along and do collecting up but we kind of did what you said we like took it to the edge yeah moved it away <clears throat> and just sort of saved it going back in the sea again yeah. pushed it up towards the dunes and yeah yeah just moved it along we, we, we do have we have a bucket a scrap bucket mm. and if you've got not iron don't put iron in it because the you know, you can't get anything for scrap because we weigh it in. You don't get anything for iron. But we chuck it in. You just chuck it in the bucket. And um, the lad that does it in the club, Peter, he, he regularly gets 60, 70 pounds for his lead and his mm-hmm. copper and his brass and just little bits and pieces. So it's worth doing. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely worth doing. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, it gets at least some rubbish off the landscape. Yeah. And it all so. helps to pay for your machine, get your machine paid for, doesn't it? You always in say a way. that. You always <laughs> say, oh, do you know, but you've got 30 pounds for something. No, you don't spend it on your machine, or do you? No. You don't spend it on someone else anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, Getting a couple of cans and a Chinese on the way back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, um, but that's another thing as well. When you're out, if you've got your pedometer on, you think, Do you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out all day. I've been on the field for like six hours. I don't know. Just, you don't. You don't. Because it's like whether the machines, the, the, the pedometers don't pick up pedometers at the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, maybe because you like sort of like slowly trudging. They don't. <laughs> they don't detect it as a step. I don't know. But, um, yeah. Well, we found uh, on the beach, like I say, that we. I thought we were going to walk the whole length of the beach and when we looked back how far we'd walked I mean it was nothing mm. we, we and we'd spent about two or three hours just yeah. doing you know half a football pitch and, and you know the, yeah. so you could easily lose a day mm-hmm. detecting and not really go very far at all uh, so yeah it, it is surprising where time at with anything that you're enjoying time just flying. oh yeah but you kind of start we all meet we always when we have our club digs 12 o'clock regardless everyone goes for lunch and you show what you found and, yeah and it, you take pictures if you want to but you know something to start and then you see people wandering to the car and you think, oh, damn, where's that gone? <laughs> yeah. So you think, I found out again. <laughs> so, <laughs> What's been your best find? The, like, have you had one where you've thought, oh, yes, this is the one? I like coins. I, I like coins. I've, I've just recently, I haven't got it with us because it's currently with Port Antiquities. I've had to hand it in. I didn't have to, but uh-huh. you, you hand it in. It's a silver, <laughs> um, it's the Emperor Trajan. So it's like 95 to 98. Uh-huh. I've got a picture. I don't know if you put a picture on the website. It, it's lovely. It, it, it's crisp. It's nice. It's really uh-huh. good. I love it. I love it. I, I contacted the Sphinx. Sphinx is the, the book the way you, you can identify your coins. Yeah. And the specimen I've got is better than that. So I thought, wow. Oh. So I've emailed them. I said, oh, do you want to take pictures? I'll send it to you. You can do professional. No, I'm not bothered. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, we'll definitely have a copy of it. Yeah, definitely. Have it. So, but yeah, that one probably is. Um, the oldest thing I've found is a Middle Bronze Age. Effectively, it's a knife. But uh-huh. I think it's it's term was it's a dirk D I R K. It's it's a knife and it'll have had a bone handle or a wood handle, mm-hmm. which is long since gone. That's the oldest thing I've found. I mean, that's beautiful. That I mean, yeah, I've seen yeah. similar yeah. in museums. Uh-huh. Yeah. I haven't been down here for very long, uh-huh. and we were in the field and I found it. And it, if anyone sees the picture, it's got like a, a, a ridge down the middle. Yep. And I thought, I thought, oh, this is something. Else. So one of the guys come up and said, what have you found there? And I said, oh, I think it's a dagger. And he said, it's off a gate. And he sort of walked away at that. So I thought, oh, okay. And it does look like a hinge off a gate uh-huh. where it's snapped off. So I thought, oh, okay then. So anyway, I didn't really know everyone then. So I, I wasn't like first back for lunch. So I was heading back for lunch. And everyone's going, come on then, show us your spear. And I was like, oh, all right, then don't, 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 don't say that. <laughs> and everyone's going, have you just found down? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, all, and they're all getting the pictures took with it. Uh-huh. And I thought it was like a big wound up. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's not, let's wind him up because he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. But no, it turns out that's what it is. It's uh, It's got to get olive green patina, which well, is quite rare. And I thought it was just a pain. To, but anyway, uh-huh. so it was always a thing. There's check. Before I chucked anything with it, he used to say, check Darren before I chucked it away. <laughs> so, that's the oldest thing. The most recent thing of note was the, the Trajan coin. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing I found, the first thing I heard was down there, the bats at Bishop Auckland, along by the river. Uh-huh. But we used to play football, cricket, tiggy, whatever you did, swimming down there, whatever we did. I didn't know where to go when I first got my detector. So I thought, well, there's no harm in going down there. I said there was more hills there and parked down there. So I imagine like a big horse, gold horse rings and stuff like that. <laughs> and anyway, I found, uh, I think it's 1890, it's a Victorian penny. Uh-huh. Just can't find nothing spectacular. But it just, I hate saying, blow me away, but it blew me away. Yeah. And I thought, oh, do you know, this has been under the ground all them years uh-huh. and I just loved it so I've kept that ever since really I did consider getting it made into a necklace then I thought oh, <laughs> that would be pretty cool yeah. but yeah so uh-huh. that's the kind of the first thing so yeah, I mean, that's, that's what, what triggered it uh-huh. yeah. and um, so yeah but probably the best thing I found was 
it's a Roman intaglio and it's set in a, a silver matrix. Um, it's it's only about it's less than two centimeters in height. It would have been a ring. Mm -hmm. And the intaglio, it's it's a carnelian stone. It's a stone you find them on beaches in South of Wales and, and in the Mediterranean. And it's like a red stone. But the Romans used to carve the, the deities into uh -huh. them or or make them for like stamps. That was from the Roman period. And and in the early 13th century, they were it was quite a common thing for the gentry to repurpose those stones. Uh -huh. They used to import them from from Rome and they would reset them inside a, a silver like bezel mm -hmm. and they, they put markings around it so they could stamp make wax stamps with those so yeah I found one of those Easter Easter day was it, it was Easter Sunday nice. about three years ago two uh -huh. years ago yeah that's currently I handed it in 14 days after nearly two years ago I handed it in it's, it's a bit of a weird one because the, the text on the outside of it it doesn't mean anything or they, they, they don't know what it means Yeah. so they've categorised it as magical which just means they don't know <laughs> so, it's always a ritual, ritual so, isn't it it's yeah. always a ritual so it, it, uh -huh. it, it's, it's magical so it, it's, it's magical and it, 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 it was its purpose was to ward off evil spirits <laughs> see it's easy it's easy working for them <laughs> you just see anything um, but I no, was I, there when Darren brought the the Intaglio and uh -huh. we literally found it that morning yeah, didn't yeah. you and um, he sort of sidled up next to me and he said have a look at this <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> oh where you going <laughs> uh, so we showed some of the academics didn't yeah, we yeah. and um, they were suitably impressed We'll be back next time with more Tales from the Trowel. Make sure you like, follow and subscribe from wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Tales from the Trowel, an Archaeology News Northeast production in association with Bitmatic Productions.